absolutely fabulous, Jacob. Thank you so much. And the Clark County Green Neighbors, thank you for understanding the importance of talking about becoming one with nature and becoming green as your last final act of all that we need to do here on the planet. So you'll see right now, you can see my presentation here. I have a lovely quote here. You will see my photo and we can talk a little bit more when the questions come, just so you know who the heck is talking to you. I think it's a little bit more personal and you can see an individual, but a little complicated if you can see me talking and you can see the presentation going. So I'm just gonna start and talk about what we're doing, where we've been, where we are now, and give you an overall grasp of what this thing called green burial that you're hearing about, that's in the zeitgeist, is all about. We're finding that just more and more people, they're asking for environmentally responsible burial options. And that's really reflecting the personal values of what's going on out there. People are taking their bags to the store. They are recycling. They're bringing their bottles and cans back for a deposit. People are trying to not eat off styrofoam anymore. And so we're deciding, well, if we're gonna bury our bodies and we walk the green walk, then why embalm with toxic chemicals? And why encase ourselves in metal or the rainforest from wood caskets or the cement or the plastic outer burial vaults and all these things. Why not just be true to the earth and be timeless and be uninterrupted in our descent and our departure out of here? So this webinar here that we're gonna talk about is going to, let me see here. Oh goodness, trying to, there we go, it's working, wonderful. So this webinar, we're gonna really talk about the efforts to return to these ancient, these eco-friendly practices. They're really gaining momentum all across the country and people are finding out ways of wanting their bodies to return to the earth. And I want to give you a really wide overview so we can spend a good half an hour with a bunch of questions. Because I know a lot of people come to this for a specific thing that they want to know about, such as how do I do this? Or where do I do this? Or why do I do this? And we can definitely answer all of that. So first off, I want to give you an overview of American burial history. And so you understand the preparation and why we do what we do. These are definitely clear pictures of families getting together and families doing this themselves and families being involved. But what we did and what was considered a normal course back in the day was the home funeral. And you can see here that this is a family that either, either had their community group of women or family here and they're laying of the dead. We have the women who washed the body and they groomed it they prepared food, the men made caskets, the, may, the men dug graves, and the process from start to finish, it really brought the family together and the community together. And death was incredible. It was an intimate experience. It was something we didn't hand off to somebody else to do. So we would have a visitation and that was normally held in the front parlor. And then that was followed by a procession to either the churchyard or the backyard. And you see here, this is what a front parlor used to be. Homes used to have this large room and it wasn't really for any other reason, but a gathering and the gathering primarily would be when somebody would pass away, we could actually lay them out and have them there. And it wasn't really the, the funeral parlor, this is what we would call the family parlor, and this is what we would use. And now, of course, these have been turned into modern family living rooms, and we don't really have the deceased this way so much. So looking back here at the Civil War, we had so many men that were on the battlefields, and you see our wonderful President Lincoln here visiting the troops. He's such an amazing enigma presence, even looking at these old photos here. We had so many boys out who fought for our countries. And the problem with so much of this is these men had passed away on the fields and they needed to be brought home because families wanted their loved ones home in their yards and they really wanted them to come and be part of the family and have the local minister say the prayers and have the women anoint them with oils and really get them back to families. So in order to do this, we had to find a way for preservation. That idea of putting someone on a train was going to be workable to get somebody back home, but the transformation was going to be really problematic because we had to have some sort of preservation going on and refrigeration wasn't going to happen. We couldn't use our ice cars and things for this. So there was a doctor on the field and the doctor came up with the concept of embalming. And you see, this is what original initial embalming used to be. This is a man out on the field. Here's a doctor. 
And it was a slow decomposition with embalming. It was basically this elixir. It was arsenic and mercury and soap and water. And it was going to allow the body to be preserved until it could be transported back home for burial. So this little guy right here, this is Willie Lincoln. And this was Abraham Lincoln's beloved 11-year-old son. He died of typhoid fever and Lincoln actually had his body embalmed because this was a brand new process and he saw how this was working. So unfortunately a, a mere three years later our beloved Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865 and so he was the first U.S. president to be embalmed. So we loved him so much everybody wanted to visit him so after his death Willie's body and his together, they traveled on the train right here. And this train traveled over 1,600 miles, and it traveled through 180 cities and seven different states. And really in a dozen or so different cities, Lincoln's casket was lowered from the train, and it was placed here to the left. You see this presidential hearse here, and it was slowly wheeled through the city. I mean, look at all those people, those floors of people that are there to see and honor the president, all the throngs of people in the street. It's amazing. We look, think back to the 1865 and think, oh my gosh, you know, not only was there not photography, but I mean, how where'd all these people come from? But all those people in mass came out to see President Lincoln's um, cortege here. And they really wanted the mourning crowds to be able to pay their final respects. So because of all of this extended publicity, this embalming concept, it took center stage and really the death care industry was born and it became something that we do now versus being in the home. All of a sudden we embalmed people and all of a sudden in this time period as well, we didn't really have the family graveyard anymore. We were moving more towards a park or a cemetery, some place where we could establish something. We had these military cemeteries that were established for the armed forces, and many of them obviously continue to be buried here. And then pretty soon we had the undertakers who were undertaking these young men, and it became this normal way of life. So no longer were the families taking care of the dead, but all of a sudden we had the undertaker taking care of them. So in the 1900s, this embalming fluid that was all the rage and made such a difference in death care because now it could be out of the house, we could transport, we could do all these different things. This stuff had to be reformulated because there were so many medical students that were falling sick because this is arsenic in here. This isn't a healthy thing. There's formaldehyde. And so that's what we switched into. We decided, well, we're going to go from we having our embalming fluid we're going to make this allegedly something safer. But the problem with this now is that we swapped hazardous chemicals. We're onto a new vat of hazardous chemicals. And now what we're finding over time here is all of the groundwater, all of these new products, we have all of the end cuts here of caskets. These are lacquered and varnished caskets and these is granite and we have steel we have all these things on the ground and this is really posing this huge laundry list of these potential groundwater problems we have all of the stuff over time releasing harmful toxins into the soil we have all the money that families are spending we have all of these items that are going to be in the ground versus above the ground for families to use so i think that's one reason why obviously the baby boomer generation that came along is saying hey you know we're really not consumers and we're realizing that the earth does matter and we do walk a green talk. And the idea of buying a huge tombstone at a family plot, our family doesn't even really have a plot, and going and buying some very expensive casket doesn't really make sense because that's not what my lifestyle is. So all of this formaldehyde, we have learned ultimately you can fill over 1 million Olympic swimming pools each and every year with all the formaldehyde that we use. And so if you think about that, that is pretty intense. All of that, all of those bodies, that's how much formaldehyde is. That, that's absolutely incredible, 1 million of those. I just like to point this out because it's something really overwhelming to think about. You don't think about it unless somebody points it out, but oh my goodness, that's really overwhelming. So taking a look here at this chart, I think this peak, this peak at this chart is so very important because it teaches us so many things that we are not aware of. You know, it's been said that there's a hundred million tons of steel that goes into the ground and every year that could rebuild a Golden Gate Bridge. And that's truly amazing to think one bridge which spans two land masses 
all these people here on the planet can cross over, that's overwhelming. If we look here too, all the trees that are used just for the board feet of the wood casket, 77,000 trees. Oh my goodness, that's really something. And the concrete for the two lane highway stretching from San Francisco to Kansas City. You can drive halfway or more, if you look at the picture, half more than halfway across the country in all those items that get buried annually. Okay, so here we are to this. And this is what a standard natural green burial looks like. And by the way, green burial, natural burial, those are all words which all mean the same thing. Eco-friendly burial, earth-friendly, it's all the same concept. It's just called green because that's sort of what we know as, I guess, a term or a buzzword or what have you, but natural burial as well. We progress to people really deciding that they want to take their rights back and they want to take their land back and that they want to think about how we can support nature and how we can be natural, how we can lessen the negative impact of human society on the environment and just a multitude of ways. And you know, supporting renewable energy. And, you know, we drive hybrid cars and the electric cars and we eat healthy and we promote sustainable agriculture. So, so many people are grasping this and saying, yeah, I want to have a conversation about this. I want to learn how I can do this for myself. So, I'm really thrilled, again, to be able to present these pictures to you and answer these questions of what this is. So, this is a man here who's in a simple cardboard box and bearing a cardboard box is legal. There really aren't state rules that say you have to be embalmed. There aren't state rules that say you have to buy a specific casket. Cemeteries might say, well, you know, a cardboard casket doesn't work for us, but many other cemeteries say, yep, yeah, great, fine, we can do whatever we want to do. So it's a matter of asking questions. And really, when you talk to a funeral home, asking and saying, we want to dress our loved one. We want to bathe our loved one. We want to keep our loved one at home. Um, we want to build our own casket. We heard we can wrap our loved one in a sheet from our bed. Is that okay? Can we do that? And that's great. And I love this picture here because he's holding apples. And then also he has some of his favorite books there. And so this is really neat. His sister had said, well, we used to eat apples and drink tea and we used to read our books and in the garden. And I thought, what a beautiful replication of this. And I don't think you could do that necessarily with a standard burial, really to be so hands-on and be so perfect. And what a loving, loving gift that she gave her brother here. All right, so when you're going to have a natural burial, what can we do about that? What does that look like, right? Um, notice over here, we have a cardboard box on the left. In the middle, we have a wool casket. On the right, we have a wicker casket. The three things that these have in common, and these, these are biodegradable. What we wanna do is have the loved one in some sort of an alternative container, and we want the loved one to be able to be placed directly into a grave, without them being folded in bombing chemicals and without them being inside of some sort of a concrete liner at the bottom of the grave. We want them to be able to joyously be laid to rest in the embrace of the earth and to be able to go back to a really natural state. So to give you that clear definition of a green burial, that means a person is buried in a container that can decompose along with their human remains and they can return to the soil. And ideally, all aspects of the green burial are really as cotton, linen, muslin, wool, silk, rayon, all biodegradable aspects. And looking over to the right, that's sort of your standard wood casket. And if you notice there, we're hoping all wood caskets don't have toxic glue. They don't have any sort of metals like screws or nails. And this has the rope. There was holes drilled into the bottom here and there's ropes that are strung through there. And that makes really lovely handles and it also makes that really um, eco-friendly and biodegradable as well. And this is what a muslin standard burial shroud looks like. These are just some layers that will unfold, unwrap. And if we were doing this in person, I would have brought one of these. And that's what I really love about having these talks in sort of a circular fashion is people can come up and they can touch the shroud and they can lay in the shroud and they can shroud somebody in the audience who wants to participate. And I think that's a really wonderful hands-on way for people to see. This really feels nice and soft and it's not scary. And you can get a little bit of experience with how to correctly wrap somebody. And then you can see a demo demonstration of it. So um, glad we can have a webinar because everybody can from the comfort of your own 
home while you enjoy your licorice tea and put your feet up, you can hear this talk and we can have this conversation. But in person, the tactile piece is really just a really wonderful way to be able to talk. And of course here, lovely burial shroud. This is obviously a sheet off somebody's bed, um, hopefully organic, non-bleached and dyed and um, just wrapped up and just placed lovingly on a lowering board and you'll see there's just so many ways to do this you can buy something you can make something there's kits funeral homes have different things there's wonderful makers of shrouds out there there are so many different links and ways you can do things or you can do something very very simple and just create something from basic cloth which is absolutely lovely as well Here's a man here right above who, this looks like a kit and he's putting his natural casket together. Down below is a casket that again is more of a coffin shape because it's the eight bends on it. But you see that the family came along with their non-toxic paint and their pens and wrote notes. And that's a really nice way, especially with grandchildren, you can really get them involved if they're gonna handwrite on the wood or on the cardboard, even on a sheet and write the messages of love and draw. That way they might not know necessarily that someone's passed away if they're very little or maybe not even know what that means, but at least they can put their pictures and their love for grandma or daddy or whomever. So nice to be very hands-on like that. And this is something that I really enjoy seeing. This is called Shelves for Life. And if you look at this on the left, while you're still above ground and able to enjoy it, it's a bookshelf, but once you lay it down and reassemble it there, we we'll take the shelves out and you actually make a lid and then you have a casket. So that's multi-purpose furniture, um, beautiful woodworking. Um, you know, from a mortician's point of view, I would see those handles on the side and say, oh goodness, I, I can see that that's a casket. But you know, the average person doesn't know. They just say, wow, that's a fantastic bookshelf. And absolutely, yes, it is. So where can we do this? We talked about how and why we should and where the heck can we do this? So I'm sharing this from a sacred moment and this is a funeral home, which is in Everett, Washington. And this lovely woman named Shar Barrett does great things with families. And she um, has put together this list of all of the green cemeteries in Washington that do allow natural burial. Um, if you take a look here, there's, if you want to take a snapshot of this, I think you, again, she has this on her website and you can see her websites there at the bottom. And this is from about a year ago, but she's compiled the addresses, the names, and then the contact information, as well as the costs, because I think it's a really important thing. We want to be very transparent with natural burial and say, okay, so we are the, the funeral home or the caretaker or whomever you designate to actually provide transportation and do paperwork, but then you need to get a cemetery involved. And these would be some of the costs if you were going to go ahead and take care of a burial in the state of Washington. And this is sort of an overall map, again, from the Sacred Moment website. And it shows you from down towards the Portland area, we have two lovely natural preserves here, the Herlin Burial Forest, as well as the White Eagle Natural Preserve. And then up above are some more hybrid cemeteries, which means they were a standard cemetery, but now they have um, some graves that are green. Um, any of these cemeteries, if you ever want to go see them, these people would love to have you. It's just a matter of getting a phone call and letting them know that you want to come. Most of the standard cemeteries, they're open. The ones that you see there up above in the Seattle and further north, but one in six, definitely. Wonderful caretakers and stewards of the land would love for you to come see their natural areas, but they, those places are a little bit remote. They would like to know you're coming and just would like an appointment, but again, very happy to show you the land and what they've got going on. So I happen to be in Oregon, and in Oregon, we're one of the states that says we can have a natural burial in our yard. This is something that we can do. We can, you can be in one of the counties that allows this. I happen to be in um, the county of Clackamas, and I am in a rural area of my county. So many of my families choose that they want to do this in their yard. So this is a picture of a woman who decided to lay her loved one to rest um, 
And I know people get a little bit put off. You look over to the left, there's a reclining chair and there's a skeleton there. I don't know why, I don't know if that was there because there was a burial, if that's always there in their yard. I'm not really sure. I was going to crop that out once, but I thought, you know, I, I want to keep the true integrity to what the yard looked like. And that's what we have here. And so if you take a look here for this family taking care of this home burial, they've picked an area which is not near a road. Um, it's further away from electric. It's not near water. It's um, obviously you can't see a standing structure nearby. They've dug an appropriate size and then the size would ultimately be whatever fits your alternative container. They only have to go down three feet, maybe four. I mean really three feet is quite perfect because you want your loved one to be right at the stratosphere of what's going on with the permaculture, with the fungi, with the energy of spores, all of that. You want that person to be right there. And, um, you know, there's a lot to think about if you are going to have a backyard burial, for instance. Um, I think people have often said, well, what happens if we sell the property? What happens? Well, you, we have to let the person know if you're selling the property, if this needs to be disclosed. It's a very important thing to let people know. I tell people, if you're going to bury somebody in your yard, why don't you go ahead and draw a map? and put some indication where the space is and then hook that into your deed or your title or whatever you want to do because what if the person who actually prepared the space they've passed on then what you know yeah there's you know grandma out there someplace in the yard but it's important to know specifically where they are in their yard and then that would need to be disclosed if the property does change hands all right, so here's, you know, a simple, a family wanting to get together. People will often say, well, who has a green burial? Is this just sort of a, a hippie thing or people who sort of want to thumb their nose to the man and not buy a cemetery space and want to, you know, do something in their yard? And I find that I've been... I just have not been amazed that all the people who I've known who've wanted to have a natural burial um, come from many different multicultural heritages. They come from different um, different stratuses as far as what they, I guess, you know, wh what their lifestyle is like, um, all of the different religions. It doesn't really necessarily cater to one group of people, which I find very warm and very embracing and very wonderful. Um, for instance, I find a lot more Catholics love this idea. Pope Francis is a big fan of green burial. So more and more families who are Catholic, for instance, have excitement about this. This is something that Jewish and Muslim cultures have been doing forever. They've been having a burial within 24 hours, and this has been happening for a long time. But I'm finding different age groups, too, have an interest in this, too. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating to just be involved with this lifestyle. This is what a completed grave looks like. Um, just a raised mound of dirt, and these are cut flowers that the family put, but ultimately what's going to grow back would be everything that's indigenous to the area, everything that is local, um, nothing that would be planted that wouldn't already be there. So occasionally families throw wildflowers uh, seeds or they want to plant something, but really you have to talk with your local person who does own or operate that cemetery or that burial ground and find out specifically what it is that they want to do. Um, I've been asked by families to say, well, wait a second, well, why can't we have private land burial in Washington? What are the rules? And ultimately, the state rule for Washington is bodies must be buried in established cemeteries. And cemeteries are ultimately run by a board of directors or a corporation or somebody. Um, if you want to have a private land burial, you can have one if you happen to own an island. And Washington is not that uncommon for people to have their own private space in an island, something you can do. If you want to establish your own cemetery, there's licensing requirements. It's not a matter of here, here's some land, you can bury somebody. We really find that there's governing rules, that there's codes, there's all these things that we fall underneath the guises of the mortuary boards and the cemetery bureaus. And we don't bury people without anybody knowing where they are. There's paperwork which tracks these things. There's also rules that we follow. But on the flip side of that, it's also very easy to have a natural burial either in a cemetery that allows it or on private land if you happen to be wanting to be buried in a state as well that would allow that. And rules change all the time. That's what I'm finding that is just 
so amazing. We have more and more states that are saying, yeah, you know, you can keep your loved one at home and you don't have to hire a funeral home. You can have somebody else file a death certificate. Most states allow transportation. Most states allow people to take care of a lot of things on their own. So it's wonderful to see that so many things go. And really what happens is the people ask for it. They often say, if you ask, you shall receive. And it's really clear, the more people that say, this is what we want. I mean, look at the plastic bags. That wasn't somebody coming along saying, hmm, let's out loud those plastic bags. It became something of interest to people. And then it became something that people were concerned about. And then there was a lot of conversation about it. And then pretty soon you have lobbyists and it all goes through the channels, but it's really, it's having talks like this, you all getting all of your questions answered and then going on and being able to take the next steps to make things happen and having communication. That's what all these death cafes are for and other conversations and other Facebook groups. It's about getting information out there, being in community, finding out resources as you need and us all moving through together. It's, you know, ultimately they keep saying with COVID-19, we're all in this together, but we really are. We are all in this together. And especially when it comes to end of life and it comes to death, we need a village and a community around us and definitely many people to have conversations with about all of this. So this is what a natural burial looks like. And if you notice, these are different scenarios. If you look to the top left, this is a cemetery called Riverview, which is in the Portland area. And they allow natural burial throughout the park, pretty much any grave you want. This family and the person who passed away was really into the Hawaiian culture. They went ahead and made a shroud with some fabric there is a standard lowering device they used. And the woman here to the left in the yellow plumeria flowers, she did a wonderful hula um, to the sunset. And I thought that was, just, that was amazing. If you look to the bottom here, this is historic Columbia Cemetery. This is in North Portland, just across the bridge from, from um, Vancouver, right across the bridge there. And this is a green burial garden. They have an area set aside which just provides for green burials. And this was people who lowered with rope. And this is a standard wood casket. We have rope lowering and they got together and did it that way. And you, if you look behind, that's where the earth is piled. And there are some shovels and the earth will slowly get, get moved back and refill the grave space. And then over to your right, this is a family all getting together and they're providing the muscle to put the soil back. Um, you might not be able to say, but in the back row, there's a white haired gentleman and he has a collar on. He is a Catholic priest and he's providing over this service and he's saying prayers and anointing. So all different types of people, all different reasons, all different attitudes, all different theories. Um, it's beautiful to really come across people who say, hey, I've heard of this natural burial thing, what is it? Or, you know what, I live in the middle of nowhere, can I do this? Or, oh my goodness sakes, we love our lavender bushes. Um, we've often joked about how we love to be laid to rest in our lavender bushes. Is this legal? Can we do this? And I really love to be able to tell a family yes. Um, if the answer is no, just because of something legal, then we can talk about all the workarounds. And again, you know, there's just so many options out there. So there are three kinds of a natural burial. And I want to touch on this because again, something really important to talk about. Looking back here, this is what we call a hybrid burial. And what this means is these were conventional cemeteries. And these have graves that are already standard where they had somebody who was buried into a grave liner and they might have had regular metal caskets or wood varnished caskets what have you but now they're deciding that we can have decedents there who can be buried in any kind of eco-friendly burial container including a shroud so that's what a hybrid burial would be if you hear the term natural burial ground. This is the idea of a burial ground, just like this is a Steelman town. This is in New Jersey, and this is the first green burial cemetery in New Jersey, and this is just green burial. They just allow decedents that aren't embalmed, as well as they won't have containers that aren't natural or from plant-derived materials. Um, 
They want everything to be real naturalistic in appearance after the burial has happened. The plants and the materials, they have them native to the region. And ultimately the patterns of the landscape, it's really derived from and really compatible with regional ecosystems. Because again, we're giving back to earth. We're allowing your loved one to be embraced in the beauty of the earth and not really disturb the earth. These two here, these are conservation burials. You'll see here conservation cemetery on your left. And conservation burial grounds, those adhere to all the requirements of natural burial ground, but also the further piece is they legitimately, they provide land conservation. And what that means is it's in this area where they're, they're um, so, you know, it's, it's funny as I get older here, not only my eyes have gotten really bad, but I trip over words. So I'm gonna, and then I just change up the word. I think, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna fight it. My brain doesn't wanna make that word come. But ultimately it's an area of land that's specifically and really exclusively designated for conservation. So a conservation burial ground, it must involve an established conservation organization that holds a conservation easement, or it has in place a deed that restricts the um, guaranteeing of long-term conservatorship and the stewardage, the stewards, there I go again, the stewardship, which means we're not going to redevelop that ever for anything else. This is truly going to be a natural area. And look how lovely this is. So here at Hartwood, it's these trees and it's more of a little bit of a, a pine forest, which is lovely. And over to right, we have a meadow and these natural places are just really really incredible. You see the sign here too, the Most Holy Redeemer. Again, there are so many Catholic cemeteries that are allowing natural burial. I, I got a kick out of that when that first happened. And I was really happy for that. My father passed away recently and um, he was a very, very devout Catholic. And it was wonderful to be able to give him what he wanted, but also be able to give him what I wanted. So he was able to go downtown to the cathedral in downtown Portland and have the Monsignor bless and say the prayers. And he was there in a natural wood casket. He wasn't embalmed. He was in a biodegradable wool suit. And then we were able to go out to a Catholic cemetery and have a natural burial. So how wonderful. And people don't realize that a natural burial doesn't mean you can go into a church. You can be driven in a vehicle across town to a grave. You can have, um, Everything that which looks standard, if that's important to you, or everything could be completely alternative and you can have somebody in your yard. You can do whatever the heck you want. And it's just wonderful that families really can be true to themselves and do what they need to do because death is so hard. And to be able to get through it by being true to the person who passed away and true to the family who's left behind is just so, so very important. All right, so I wanted to take a moment here to tell you that there are two other green options. In case you've listened to this and thought, mm, you know, I love the green idea, but don't think green burial for me, either in a cemetery which is designated for green spots or in someone's private property is my bag. Here's two different ideas. So this right here, this was the burial at sea. And this is the disposition method, which is legal in all 50 states. Ultimately, a body is released, a deceased body, I should say. I don't know why I need to clarify that, but people will ask me that for some silly reason. It'll be released into the ocean and it sinks to the ground and it decomposes naturally. And people have said to me, oh my goodness, I thought I couldn't have a sea burial unless I was in the military or, or you know, I only see the Kennedys do this. I didn't realize this is for everybody, but you bet. You don't have to live by the ocean to do this. You can actually be transported to the beach there are some places, um, even there in, uh, there's three um, ports in the Seattle area that go ahead and do this. Um, there's three, there's a couple different funeral directors up there, which have a lot of knowledge about that and will help that. And then if you're in Oregon listening, I help families with burial at sea. And there's three ports here in different places in Oregon, which we can allow that. And you know, it's a really lovely green consideration. It's a green burial, but rather than being in the soil, you are in the ocean and it also involves no embalming. It also involves a container that's not made of steel or concrete. It's biodegradable. It's something that can be done. And if you have questions about it, again, look it up. 
It's, um, there's a wonderful organization called New England Burials at Sea. They have tons of information and they have a wonderful captain who's willing to have long in-depth conversations with you and send you tons of links of videos. And he lives and breathes this stuff and wants everybody to have a burial at sea. So I love his passion <laughs> and he's there to answer whatever you need. Okay, and this right here, this is a green cremation. This is, um, they, we call it so many things. We call it eco-friendly cremation, water cremation, bio cremation. You might have heard of um, the aqua dissolution or the hydrolysis or resumation. We just have so many darn words for this. So sooner or later, who knows if we'll streamline that, but that's where we are right now. And this is an alternative to the flame-based cremation. So this is a really quiet, gentle process. It uses water, it uses potassium hydroxide, and ultimately the body reduces down to the basic element of bone ash, and the ashes are returned to the family. So just like a standard cremation, you will receive an urn back with ashes. The ashes look a little bit different because of the soft tissue and because of the process of everything. It's a very clean process, so the ashes look a lot more white, and you do receive more ashes back. It's very fascinating, but this process was adapted to funeral homes. It was used at the Mayo Clinic, and it was used in their autonomy bequest program for quite a while, and then it now became open to the general public. So there's 18 states which allow this and have this up and running. Oregon is one of those states. We have two machines in the state of Oregon where we can provide this for families. Washington is interesting. Um, back in May 2019, legislation was passed and it became something which is going to be on the books, but it has not been licensed yet. It's still, the kinks and everything is still being worked out. So look for that to happen. Another thing I wanted to mention is people keep hearing about resumation and that idea of used to be the urban death project but now it's resumation same thing that's passed through legislature but it is not yet a legal form of disposition just because the licensing isn't there there isn't it's not up and running it's not a form that people can choose at this time so it's an it is something you might have questions about that but again um, what i need to talk about is what you can really do with yourself so if you want to have a green burial at this time you can have the aqua or you can have the natural green burial, or you can have the burial at sea. Because I know that gets confusing for people. Some people will say, well, I just want to be donated to science. Wonderful choice, but again, there will be some remains left over, and there's something has to happen with those remains, and you'll have to have a burial, or you'll have to have some form of a cremation once those remains are, because something will be left over. So it's not a full form of disposition to be given to science, even though it's a wonderful step in between. Okay. So, this looks fun, huh? I like this. This is a wonderful group, a family, friends, a tribe, people who gather together who are going to lay their loved one to rest. So if this looks a little bit more of up your alley and what you want to do, know that you really can do it your own way and you can really do it in your own timing. It's something I really like about the idea of a natural burial at home is you can have your visitation hours whenever the heck you want them. You can also have your burial whatever day and time works for you. You're not really checking in with somebody. You're just doing what works together collectively as a family. There's no overtime fees on a Saturday or Sunday and all these things. So I've often really appreciated that. A um, couple other things to talk about. We are almost done, but just wanted to give you a little bit more of an overview here. This is Funeral Coach. This is a truck that somebody used. We are at a hybrid cemetery here in Oregon, but the family said, well, we want to provide the transportation. Can we bring him in our own vehicle? And I said, absolutely, you can. So the wonderful thing about that, even though they're using a funeral home, you can save money because you're providing your own transportation. You also can have that final ride with your loved one, which I think is really special for some people. Some people want to be really, really, really hands-on and do everything. Other families say, no, I kind of want the funeral home to be involved. And most states, it is legal to transport an individual who has passed away in a personal vehicle. You can use a minivan, a truck bed with a canopy, um, station wagon, you know, simple pickup truck. There's lots of ways that you can do this. But again, we want to make sure your state 
is what you can do in Washington. It's fine. If you're, let's say you're driving your loved one to Kansas, well, there's going to be probably throughout there, maybe a couple states that might say, uh, you know, we don't really like transportation not to be out of the care of a funeral home. So again, you know, those are steps and things that get worked through, but all the information is online. I've had Jacob, I gave him a couple links to be able to put up so people can really look at all of the breadth of information. There's so much help out there for people who want to be able to do things themselves and not necessarily pay a funeral home. So it's really fantastic. This right here, so this is my little parlor, Cornerstone. It's a repurposed goat barn in the country. So I said um, goat barn. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's very humble and it's fun. So I like it. I can keep the prices really low, obviously, because you're not paying for my marble facade. But I wanted to show you this picture because these is a family. Um, one of these men is the husband of the woman who is in the church, the truck bed here. And he said, I want to transport her to the National Cemetery. And I'm not quite sure how to do that. So we walked them through how they can do that. Because actually, at the National Cemetery, especially here at Willamette National in Portland, you can have a green burial. Wonderful to be able to give that information to families. You can do something natural. They wanted to go ahead and have her on this lowering board and in this shroud. But they didn't really know how to do that. They said, well, can we bring her to you? And can you shroud her for us? And can you provide the lowering board and all that and goodness gracious absolutely so funeral homes can help you as much as you need or as little so that's my darling husband there right there it's Michael he's helping put this loved one into the van giving the gentleman some instruction and then they're going to go ahead and take her up to the natural cemetery so at the national cemetery which yeah it's kind of a natural cemetery so again um you can do as much as you want by yourself or you can pay a funeral home just for the little bits they're helping you with all right so this is sort of the you know a lovely lovely i just love this picture I, I can't get enough of this picture this is um not a burial that i was a part of so i don't know how to who to give credit to for this but i just find this so beautiful and so wonderful and you know ultimately my fervent hope is what we talked about today and the questions that you have will we'll show you that there is practical logistical there's spiritual support that you can get there's a lot of joys in laying your loved one to rest in your own way and you can really do it in manners that are meaningful and important to you so at least i hope that some of the things we talked about will resonate and either jives for some more questions will get you to get online and take a look we'll get you to talk to some people and ultimately i think it's important that what we're trying to do here is take care of the land because someday you will be a part of it and my um my final parting thoughts are i have to really acknowledge the obvious that death is hard and we are rarely prepared for it. Even though we know somebody might be passing away, we might have hospice involved, we might be caretaking them next to their bedside. When we're faced with that moment of reality, I think sometimes all that we plan just goes out the window. That idea of, oh, well, I was going to do this, or oh gosh, I was going to build this, or I wanted to do this. You have to really be gentle on yourself. I think emotions are just very raw. They're very unexpected. You can't always follow through with everything you wanted to do. And maybe you just didn't have time to do all those things. And, you know, you didn't fail your person who passed away. It's really important to remember that it's okay, that life isn't perfect, and ultimately, neither is death.